to uh, welcome all of you out there in Cyberland uh, for the third day and second uh, talk of the fourth uh, uh, you know, digital process of signal and applications uh, school uh, promoted here in South Brazil. And we are very pleased and, and, and honored uh, to have uh, as our speaker uh, this, this morning, uh, this afternoon, or you out there, um, mm -hmm. to speak for from MPEG, immersive video to holography. Uh, we are very happy that uh, Professor Gucilla Fruit uh, agreed to, to come and speak to us on this very hot topic and next uh, frontiers he is working on. And a few words about uh, Professor uh, Lafruit. Uh, he's associate professor at uh, virtual reality and light field technology at the uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles, which is the free university at Brussels. Um, and he received his master and PhD degree in engineering with specialty in electronics from uh, the Free University of Brussels, which is VUB, which is the Free University of um, Brussels, the Flemish wing of Brussels University. So he finished the PhD in 1995, and for the last 25 years, he has worked very actively in the domain of visual data analysis and compression, participating uh, in you know, chairing many activities and compression standardization committees like CCSDS on for space applications, taking part on JPEG, still picture coding, and PEG, moving picture coding. And uh, after 17 years, he was a tenured principal investigator in IMAC, the Nanotechnology Observe Center, world famous in Leuven, Belgium. He joined the, uh, the faculty of the University of Hasselt in Belgium. Uh, there he took uh, over topics on multi-camera computational image, imaging, combining multiple image modalities into one visual and meaningful representation. And in 2014, uh, he changed the uh, institutions and he joined the LISA uh, department of the uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles, the Free University of Brussels. Uh, LISA stands for the Laboratories of Image Synthesis and Analysis, where he's now associate professor in light field technology and virtual reality. He has had many technical accomplishments in the field. Um, most recently, in 2018, he actively uh, contributed to, the, to part of the MPEG reference software for immersive experience that will eventually be promoted by mid next year to the MIV standard, the MPEG immersive, immersive vision standard. So as you see, you know, Professor Lafoot has contributed, uh, you know, many, many years in this field and he will be, you know, synthesizing those things to us today. Uh, he was also co-chair of the MPEG uh, Free Viewpoint TV working group and the Light Field Immersive Media Joint Ad Hoc Group between MPEG and JPEG Standardization Committee. So he has had many projects like uh, uh, the 3D Licorne A project, uh, which is a joint project with uh, uh, VUB, uh, Sony, uh, Sony Depth Sensing Brussels. is a project that has a financing of 2 million years over three years period and just finished already. And, um, you know, uh, the idea there was aimed at, you know, from any research user request to point by fusing image from multiple fixed RGB and that camera's position around the scene. So uh, there are many, many things to be, to be said about uh, uh, Professor Lafoot, but uh, it's better to, to leave him, uh, you know, to speak of all of those advancements. And uh, just recently, you know, just uh, to close, uh, he started to head uh, a new project, a two-year project uh, in European Innovation Action, called uh, a project called Hobitron, uh, which has uh, close to 2 million euro budget in collaboration with Creal, with uh, DLR, uh, which I think is Germany and uh, with European EPM, which is the uh, Polytechnic University of Madrid. So, uh, well, I'll leave the floor now. The floor is virtual, You're leaving the, the audio and image for uh, Professor Gauthier. Thanks again, Gauthier, on behalf of the organizers here uh, uh, of this uh, school. Thank you for accepting this invitation. We are truly honored and looking very much forward to, to listen to, you, to, to your uh, you know, looking into the transition to holography in the future from all the things that you have done in immersive video. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sergio, for this uh, long <laughs> introduction. Uh, so yes, I will talk about uh, the immersive video activities that are happening in MPEG and that we have used in the project Hoviton to do holography. So uh, this is, in a nutshell, the, the presentation that I will give. So immersive experience means to us technology-wise, multi-camera input 
and any viewpoint outputs. So you will see that it's not only about head-mounted devices. It can be a lot of other things. Um, we have been working in what is called MPEG immersive video, which is now called MIF. So keep these abbreviations in, in your mind because there will be a lot of abbreviations. So you might say that it's something looking like light fields. But there is also another activity in NPEG that is called uh, video based point cloud coding, VPCC. And actually, P VPCC and MIF are very uh, well, almost the same, let's say. Um, Fernando Pereira yesterday gave already a talk about what are the commonalities, the differences. I will come on that uh, later on in my presentation. But at the end of the day, MPEG, the MPEG standard has decided to put MIF and VPCC together in something that they call visual volumetric video based coding, which is V3C. So everything will be about V3C. And we have used that technology in the Hovitron project to do something about holographic vision. So first of all, what do we want to do? We want to have a scene surrounded by cameras and you want to have an immersive experience and you see here it's just by switching from one camera to another uh, you can really float uh, have a free navigation in the scene um, but this is not the only thing that you can do you can also um, have a vr experience just a moment because i have a lot of windows here on my screen uh, a vr experience like this where you see the guy with a head mounted device looking to the scene and very important here is that the guy even though he's standing and he's just uh, turning around with his head actually his body is also a little bit moving left and right if you look closely um, and, and that gives motion parallax that should also uh, be represented in the, the rendering that he's experiencing in his head mount device. And then we have also the light field uh, displays where you basically project hundreds of different images in uh, different directions so that you have a, an impression of 3D without wearing glasses. So all this is immersive actually. And it's always about having multiple input data, multiple input camera views, and multiple output data that you want to create. And the question is, of course, how can we compress all these things? If you have hundreds of video streams, uh, you, you need a high compression. Here you have another example. Uh, this is actually a light field display that is in, um, well, the the Brussels University, but the Dutch wing. Uh, you know, Belgium is a difficult country with uh, two different uh, cultures. Um, so the scene that you see here is a scene that we have made ourselves, but it's not a 3D scene. It, these are just images. Uh, I will come on that later on. So it's really a light field display, though it's called holographica. So it's, it's actually only light fields. And then we have made some uh, holograms uh, using the same kind of uh, V3C MIF-like technology. And here you see some examples. So this is a, a hologram of the same scene, low resolution hologram. Perhaps you see that uh, you have here like square pixels. But this is a hologram fully calculated out of some images to the scene and depth maps. I will explain in more details later on how it works exactly. And this is a, a new hologram that we have made at high resolution. So here too, it's only with a couple of images and depth maps that we can create any viewpoint uh, to the hologram. And then we have here at the bottom, I will change the, yes. Uh, so we have the Ho Hovitron uh, project where uh, the guy is wearing an HND that is actually holographic. So he can really see an image in the scene where he can focus his eyes on whatever object in the scene at whatever distance uh, without changing any parameters. So this is really holographic vision. Let me go to the next slide. So why standards? Well. 
Uh, you know, with the pandemic, uh, we are very lucky that we have an MPEG standard to communicate by, by video. So you see standards are very important. Actually, if you want information about all the possible standards that exist, uh, have a look to, to this link. This is a very good link and you will see this, this video actually on YouTube. It's, it's a very nice video that and you, you will understand that there are a lot of standards in the world. And without them, we would not be able to interoperate uh, between each other. Let me first give some ideas on how such a standard is made. Huh? Um, because sometimes you might think a standard is made for industrial people, that's true. But academic people have also a part to play in, in that game. And here you see basically the, the life cycle of uh, such a, a standard. So you start from requirements, something like we need volumetric video. And then some experiments are done to come after uh, a long story to the standard. And one of the first experiments are the exploration experiments. So we explore whether there is technology out there that can make volumetric video. There, actually, the academic people have a big role to play because if there is no technology, well, you will see that a lot of industrial people look to us to, to say, well, uh, can you develop something? So the, the very first novel ideas for new standards, they often uh, start in academic um, uh, domains. And so you have exploration experiments, core experiments, whatever. And then after a while, when you understand what kind of technology can really um, give the, 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 the requirements that you were looking for, then little by little, you start to create documents and software and, and whatever else, which is done in different phases, working draft, uh, draft international standard, et cetera, to end up in a standard. And that standard is a document that says what is the format of the bitstream that you have to transmit. But there is also software that supports all that functionality. And in, it is in this big process that we have played a role in the exploration and the core experiments. And then after a while, it has been taken over by the industry to come up uh, to what is now called MIF uh, and eventually V3C. And so I will explain a little bit what is the technology that we developed uh, to come up uh, to the standards. And as I said, in the exploration, you first look whether there is already technology existing to do immersive video. And actually, at that time, there was some technology called OpenGL that gives you the possibility, indeed, to have um, uh, free navigation experience to a scene. So you have here the roller coaster and you can see, <coughs> sorry, in your head mounted device, uh, you can see the roller coaster. So uh, that, that technology existed, but the content is really synthetic content only. Uh, you have to model the scene completely. You, you have to represent all the objects with a mesh and then you have to put textures on this mesh to, to really create uh, a full object. So it's only really good for games, I would say. Uh, it's not really good for having natural looking, realistic looking content. So that's why people were looking for other technologies. And there was another technology that existed at that time, uh, which is 360 video, where you basically have a big panoramic view that corresponds to 360 degrees around you. And okay, you can look to a portion of that uh, video uh, through your head mounted device. That, that looks nice. Um, be careful though, huh? even though it's only just a video that is somehow put on a sphere, let's say, um, it's not that easy to, to make such uh, a video from different viewpoints. So if you capture the scene from different cameras, you have to, to stitch all these videos together. And uh, here you see, for instance, that there are some artifacts. Huh? If you look, for instance, to the guy here, and he's moving at one point in time, 
uh, it's, it's like split in two. Uh, that means that he went from one camera view to another camera view. So you see, it's not that easy to make just a 360 video. Uh, it's, it's already challenging. And moreover, the big problem of that 360 degree video is the fact that you are always standing right in the middle of the sphere. So you have that big sphere on which a video is projected and you are always there exactly in the middle of that sphere looking to a portion of that video. The problem is that if you have the sphere around you and you are moving left and right, the image on the sphere is not changing at all. It's exactly the same image that, that you see. And this sometimes gives uh, creepy effects. Uh, suppose that you have on, on that image a statue. Well, if you move left or right, the statue is really following you. And so this kind of technology is not good enough to do immersive video because it only gives you three degrees of freedom. So the older rotations are OK. But once you do translations, things are going wrong. And that's why we had to develop new technology, which has been called Tweedoff Plus. Actually, it's six degrees of freedoms, but in a limited volume. And again, you see the guy here that uh, somehow is moving a little bit left and right. And all that should happen also, should be visible as motion parallax in the video that he, he sees. So there was a need to recreate or to develop some technology for that kind of immersive uh, video. And then at the same time came basically JPEG Plano and they had a solution which is called actually Planoptic cameras. So these are cameras where you have micro lenses that capture the light rays from different directions. And so somehow you, you get an image like this uh, and you can then transform that into an image that gives you that motion parallax. So you, you see there is a, a little parallax, a little movement. So if you move left or right, you can recreate the right image. But it's very limited in, in volume. Uh, so you can only move, let's say, a couple of millimeters left and right, uh, while basically when you have a head-mounted device on your face, you are always moving let's say 20 centimeters or, or something like that. So that technology was not good enough to do immersive uh, video. And so people then were thinking, yeah, why not reconstructing a natural, a real scene, completely reconstructing it in 3D, and then just use the OpenGL technology that, that we had before for games. And somehow that is perfectly possible if you take some pictures of the scene, there exists something that is called photogrammetry that gives you the possibility to completely reconstruct the, the object. And it's of quite good quality, better quality than what you see here on the, on the screen. Um, but only for, yeah, let's say statues and buildings and, and, and things like that, there it, it works fine. But if you have people uh, like here, th this lady, for instance, and you reconstruct uh, the person really in, in a kind of 3D shape uh, to be used for OpenGL, you see that something is wrong. Uh, look to her face, to her expression. She, she looks a little bit like a good doctor in, in the, the series, the television series. Um, so th there's something wrong. Uh, also, um, when you have movements, uh, the characters are moving strangely and you can never really explain what is wrong, but you feel something is wrong. Um, so you see, it's not that simple just to say, let's do a 3D reconstruction of the scene of the characters and, and then everything will work fine. Uh, you need sometimes a little bit more, but nevertheless, MPEG said, okay, let's do uh, point cloud coding you know, and Therefore, you need some content. And here you, you see uh, one of the content that is called uh, long dress. Uh, the reconstruction is not perfect. And you see everything that is related to the hair, to little details, is never well rendered. So be careful, let's say, with um, all these kind of 3D reconstructions. 
Um, and actually be careful for the what is called the uncanny valley. Uh, so that is the fact that you have a, uh, the feeling of looking to someone who is a little bit creepy. Um, so the uncanny valley says that the more realistic is your character, uh, the more you like it. But when you are very close to a real human character, any little detail that is not correct will make it look creepy. And so you will dislike it completely. So I would say point clouds are nice, but they have indeed some uh, disadvantages. They also have advantages. For instance, here in this application, you have the guy that is looking to a virtual copy of um, his daughter that is uh, standing in another room. So you have here a number of cameras that basically capture uh, the, his daughter and recreates a point cloud. And the advantage, of course, when with the point cloud is that you can interact with the objects. You can really touch the object yeah, if you have force feedback, of course, which is not possible with, with other technology. So sometimes uh, you have really to be careful on what kind of technology you are using, point clouds, light fields. Uh, Fernando yesterday was talking about the, the, the same dilemma. Be careful when you use point clouds without thinking twice, so I would say. Here another example of Microsoft. Uh, so again, the lady is captured with a number of cameras, also depth sensing devices. And you see, this is the point cloud that is reconstructed. Uh, not really nice, I would say. And you always have to smooth things, uh, to filter things out to get something reasonable. But you see, this lady doesn't look natural at all. Uh, again, the hair is not OK. Her expressions on the face are not OK. Um, so really having a 3D model of, of any person and object in the scene is really not a, such a good idea. And just to, to show you that by example, uh, what you see here at the left is a 3D model completely reconstructed from 500 pictures uh, with that photogrammetry. And the same scene at the right, where we have taken only four pictures and the depth maps. So for each picture, we also have the depth. And by some magic um, processing, you get actually correct motion parallax and a correct feeling of what's happening in the scene. Um, and it looks much more natural at the right side. If you look, for instance, to the boat here, it's a hairy thing. Uh, it has a lot of fur. Um, it, it looks quite OK. While here, at the left side, uh, it, it's really not OK at all. So sometimes it's, it's better just to do the images, and that's it. And that is what we call light fields in, in Epic, whatever the real definition of light fields. So here again, uh, at the left side, you see the reconstructed objects where you have really something that is completely wrong, even though hundreds of images were taken to do that photogrammetry. At the right side, by just using the images and somehow combining the images, you can still have these little details that, that are uh, preserved. And this is, uh, the right side is actually the MIF technology. You just an example we have on the device. So this is my uh, researcher that is uh, basically looking through that scene. The scene is not 3D modeled at all. Uh, so these are just a couple of pictures, uh, four pictures, uh, that are somehow combined to give a perspective effect, um, taking into account the, the position, let's say, of uh, the head of the person. And this is a close-up of what he sees. So I admit you see sometimes little black spots um, that can still be improved. Uh, but that's also because we come too close to the scene and then you, you see these uh, black spots. Um, but OK, these are the two images that he sees in his stereoscopic head-mounted uh, device. And everything in the middle is quite OK, especially when you are not too close uh, to the scene. So let me explain how, how this works in, in a couple of uh, pictures. 
Um, so it's, it's basically called depth image based rendering. So it's a rendering that you do with images only and with depth. And that's, that's important to understand. And what I will show you is that actually, if you reinterpret it a little bit, it's like a point cloud. So what happens in this process of depth image based rendering is that you have a number of camera views, uh, let's say here two, and you would like to recreate a virtual view to the scene in the middle. How can you do that? First, you need the depth maps at high resolution, by the way. So I will not explain how you come to these depth maps. And then of course, once you have the pixel colors and their depth, you can just push the pixels into space. And that's what you will see here after a while. And that recreates basically the scene in space. I will explain later where these triangles come from. So just keep in mind for the moment that we have pixels, we know their depth and we have pushed these pixels into space. And then once you have done that, well, you can reproject this point cloud actually to the virtual view that you would like to recreate. And this is the middle view that you see here. That's in a nutshell how MIF is working. So the technology that is using depth image based rendering. So um, here again, a summary, sorry for the low resolution uh, at, the, at the left side, uh, but you have the pixels, you have their depth, you push them into space, you get actually a point cloud, and then you can reproject that point cloud to whatever virtual view that you want uh, to have. Doing that with only one camera, you will always create this occlusion. So you have this camera view that corresponds to the left view here. You reproject it to a virtual view and you can, you create something like that. So you see that you have here regions around the silhouette that were not visible in the original camera view, but that get visible because you look from another viewpoint. These are called disocclusions that you have to fill in somehow. And actually it's not difficult to fill them in if you take another camera view and you reproject it uh, the same to the, to the same virtual view, you might have another, another reprojection that, that looks like this. So you see, you have these disocclusions at the other side than the left reprojection. And by blending these two images, you recreate the final virtual view. So it's, it's actually in principle, very easy uh, to do. And here you have some examples where you actually see that it's like a point cloud. Yeah? So what we see here are reprojections of a number of camera views and the, the numbers that you see here, the one, three, five, seven correspond to the number of camera views that have been reprojected to the virtual view. And the virtual view here is a little bit uh, switching from left to right. And you see when you have only one camera view that you reproject, you get really like a point cloud. You, you see the points here and you see also these, these occlusions that, that cannot be filled because you only have one uh, viewpoint. But if you have three camera views here at the top right, you see you fill in already a lot of these missing information. And if you have five camera views, uh, you fill in even more. And you, if you have seven camera views, you fill even more. So this is really image-based rendering or depth image-based rendering. But if you think about it, it's like a point cloud. You have implicitly created a point cloud in that reprojection uh, system. Now, to come back to these little cracks that you, you see here and, and here around the, the lady, these are happening because you have pushed a number of pixels, let's say adjacent pixels into space and during the reprojection, you have separated these pixels. So in the virtual view, they are not side by side anymore. And this gives you cracks. And a simple way to solve that is actually to use triangles. And that are the triangles that I showed you before in, in the video. But you have to be very careful what these triangles really mean. 
The triangles are basically connecting adjacent pixels, neighboring pixels in the camera view. So instead of just having pixels, you just create little triangles between all these pixels. And these triangles will then be projected into space. Like you see here at the right, you have the image. Instead of having only the pixels that are the black spots, you also create triangles that are projected to the scene. These were the triangles you saw in the video before. And then you reproject these triangles to the virtual view. And doing that, basically, you avoid any hole. There will be only these occlusion holes, but not little cracks, because uh, the, the pixels are getting uh, too far away from each other. There's, however, one big problem with that is the fact that if you have a foreground object and a background object, they are connected also with these triangles that get very elongated. And that can really give very strange effects like this. So here you have basically a scene that has been captured by an, an Ozo-like, uh, Facebook-like uh, camera with, with cameras in, in a sphere. Um, and all the camera views are reprojected somehow. And you see around the silhouette, if you don't do anything, yeah, you get very elongated triangles that are, of course, not what you want. But it's very easy to detect elongated triangles. Actually, it's just the size of a triangle compared to his uh, area that, that determines whether it's elongated or not. And so getting rid of them is a very simple thing. And there you have then uh, the, the final rendering where the only thing that is missing are these occlusions, uh, like, like here, the, the black spots. Uh, this is because you move far away from the sphere of cameras and you are missing information that you, you can never really fill in. So just to give you an idea of what you get as final result. So here you don't only have a rotation, you also have little translational movements. And yes, OK, that gives you um, a right, uh, a correct uh, rendering uh, by using that image-based approach that actually looks like uh, a point cloud. So up to now, I have actually explained to you on one side the point clouds, the real point clouds uh, with the reconstruction uh, 3D reconstruction, and at the other side, um, the image-based rendering or the depth image-based rendering, and they are called VPCC and MIF respectively in, in MPEG, but they are very similar. And actually what MPEG then decided is to say, well, since they are very similar, let's put them together in that V3C format. What I didn't explain yet, is the compression, because now we know how to do the rendering, we know how to recreate any viewpoint to the scene, but how is the compression working? And there too, there are a lot of similarities between the point clouds on one hand and the image-based rendering on the other hand. Now we'll skip this thing. So with point clouds, what is called VPCC in MPEG, you have an object, and I insist on that, that in point cloud coding, they do the coding object by object. That's important. So you have here the lady, and the lady is volumetrically here, surrounded by a bounding box, okay. the, the bluish uh, purple like uh, bounding box here. And what we do is we just project that lady orthographically on each side of the cube. So that's what you get here. So instead of coding all the points in space of the lady, we are going to code, let's say, all these projections that now become 2D projections, actually. And there's also a, a little subtle thing here. It is that actually the lady is also segmented in patches. And these patches are more or less flat. They have more or less. Uh, all the pixels or the, the voxels actually in that patch have more or less the same orientation. Uh, so you have here the shoulders, for instance, uh, they, this is a patch, her face is another patch. And all these patches are put together in an image. 
So you have the face of the lady that has been projected somewhere on the cube as a patch, and you see here her face popping up here. Uh, you have the shoulder that is probably, I don't know, this part of, of that part. So by putting all these patches together, we have recreated a 2D image that changes in time, that is a video, and we just use a video codec to code uh, that image. And then at the decoder, you decode the image and you reproject inversely to recreate the lady. Of course, you have also uh, to transmit the depth. Uh, so the depth is here, the distance between a voxel of the lady and the corresponding side of the cube. Uh, so these are also patches. And by transmitting these two things here as videos, you can recreate the lady perfectly. Also notice that uh, the experiments have indicated that for coding one object, you need 25 to 50 megabits per second. And this is quite high. You have to know that for uh, your television sets, um, you, let's say ultra high definition, uh, 4K, um, you need 10 megabits per second to have perfect quality. Here, the price to pay to be able to have an interactivity with an object is that you need much more bandwidth. Uh, you need, let's say, five times higher uh, bit rates to transmit, let's say, information, which is just a small piece of the information of the full scene. So you see, um, it's quite expensive, nevertheless, though we have used video codecs that are actually very uh, efficient. And one of the reasons actually is that you have here these patches that are completely disconnected from each other and you have also discontinuous edges. This basically, well, well the edges, um, it creates actually a high bitrate uh, jump. Uh, so, you, so you need a lot of additional bits to be able to code uh, discontinuities and to avoid that um, there are solutions that basically will fill in these gaps. And so here for the, the soldier, uh, you, you have here, uh, let's say this region here at, at the bottom that is actually empty, but instead of having black spots, uh, we just gradually smooth out the colors to have a video that is, let's say, better performing for uh, the, the coding. But still, you get something like 25 to 50 megabits per second. Um, and then uh, actually in MPEG, we are at the, the position, the phase where we have done uh, compression of point clouds. We are now exploring the compression of meshes. And this is something that you see here. Huh? So here the guys have been really reconstructed as a complete mesh and transmitted. Uh, this is a solution from Microsoft. Uh, I'm not saying that MPEG will follow uh, that solution, probably not. Um, but it's just to give you that point cloud coding is now mature in MPEG. But we would like to go to mesh coding uh, to additional uh, functionalities. And this is now in exploration. So let me now come back to the MIF, so the image based rendering approach there also there is a compression that has to be done and how is that compression done well actually you you can see a lot of similarities with point cloud coding again so suppose that you have a camera made of well a sphere made of 24 cameras uh, facebook uh, also like uh, uh, capturing device so you have here 24 images of this kind, so here in the first column. And also suppose that you have the depth maps somehow magically that you, you can find depth, okay? You would need to transmit all that information to the client to be able to recreate these 24 views and then to recreate any other viewpoint by uh, the, the method that I showed you before, uh, the depth image-based rendering. And so this is very costly. And so the MPEG solution is basically to 
reduce the number of views to transmit. Instead of transmitting 24 views, what does MPEG do in MIF? It basically recreates, let's say, one view. There are different variants, huh, but I will explain it very easily. So you have huh, your sphere with 24 different camera views. Instead of transmitting all of them, we transmit one view that corresponds to the central position in between all these cameras. So it's basically a kind of 360 video that you have here. So it's a stitching somehow uh, between all these 24 views to create uh, that panoramic video. And also you have the depth uh, that corresponds to that that you have to transmit. And with doing that, you have basically really created a 360 video uh, application. It's a trade off where you can sit exactly in the middle of that sphere and you can look around. But you cannot still, not yet, basically move in that sphere. What we now need to do is to transmit additional information to be able to also be to move in, in that sphere. And that additional information comes, of course, of these 24 cameras that are on the sphere. But instead of transmitting these 24 images, what MPEG is doing is basically, if you have the middle, the central point in that sphere, represented by this upper uh, panoramic view, and you have a camera view that you would like to transmit, what you can do is you reproject that camera view to the central view, and you only transmit the difference between these two. And that difference is actually also a kind of disocclusion. These are these, these small portions around the silhouette of the object. These are the things that you transmit. All the rest you do not transmit. And so instead of transmitting 24 images, you now transmit one big image, and then all these little differences that you see here uh, along the borders. And doing that in an intelligent way, you have bit rates of 50 to 100 megabit per second, which is huge. Uh, but remember that with point clouds, we had already 50 megabit per second for one object. Uh, so each object here, each person in the scene was up to 50 megabits per second. Now, if you don't need to interact with all these objects separately and move these objects, you can say, no, I'm not going to use a point cloud coding object by object. I'm just using MIF, right, the image-based approach, where all these objects are all together in one scene. And then you transmit that single scene as, well, images, but actually, if you think about it, it's equivalent to the point clouds, um, the implicit point clouds that you create by pushing the pixels into the space. So just uh, to, to give you an idea of these, what is called atlases, so these patches that are transmitted are atlases. Um, here you see at the left side, uh, the atlas of the lady. So all these patches disconnected, then there have been improvements to have patches that are smoothly, uh, let's say, connected to each other. This is the point cloud coding, what you see at the left side. And at the right side, it's the solution for MIF, uh, so the image-based approach, where you have multiple input views, and then you transmit one view together with these patches. And this is also an atlas. Of course, here you see that it's not perfect yet. Huh? So there, there is probably a way to, to better put these uh, different patches together and, and really even reduce further the, the bit rate. But visually, you see that the atlas that you have in a point cloud coding looks the same as an atlas that you have in the image-based approach. And that's the reason why uh, MPEG has decided to put VPCC point cloud coding and MIF immersive video image-based rendering together into one format, which is basically the V3C format. And this is where we are now. Huh? So there is a V3C bitstream format that can be used both for point clouds object by object and for image-based rendering as a full scene. Now MPEG is already thinking of 
extensions. One of the extensions is basically to have um, changing colors when you move from one position to another. So you have here the horse, which is a 3D model. And you see that the color is changing depending on its position because of the lighting effects. And this is called surface light fields. There are discussions to include them. It's really exploratory for the moment, but it, it indicates that there will be extensions of the current uh, codec towards more functionalities, and this is uh, one of them. Also at the MIF side, so the, the side image-based uh, rendering, there are also considerations to do some extensions. And these extensions are not even changes in the bitstream. These are just profiles, as they call them. It's basically reusing the same bitstream, but reinterpreted in, in another way. <laughs> And one of the interesting approaches uh, that have been discussed basically last week, uh, the, the uh, previous MPEG meeting was last week, is called uh, multiplane images, MPI. They also need depth. And these MPI images, they can give you that kind of uh, 3 dof plus 6 dof uh, impression. And also reflections can, can be correctly handled. So if you look around, it, it's a, a quite shiny uh, scene. Uh, reflections can also be handled by MPI somewhat. Uh, let's not exaggerate. But these MPI images also need depth. Uh, so what you see here, oops, sorry. Uh, this is a, a depth map, a colored uh, depth map, uh, let's say. And you see the mirror, for instance, uh, has a depth that is corresponds to the background, which is perfectly correct huh? because you have a reflection through, uh, through the mirror. So the idea is basically to reuse the V3C MIF-like uh, data format or bitstream format even uh, to enable these multiplane images. Now, Multiplane images, uh, so this is just under consideration in exploration. It's not yet standardized, and let's, let's be clear about that. Um, multiplane images, they are what uh, they, they seem to be. You know? So you have multiple planes somehow that, that you create. And how do you do that? In a nutshell, uh, you have a depth map or disparity map. And instead of putting all the objects, let's say, in one image, you just put uh, the, the different objects at the different depths in different layers, in different images, uh, as you can see here. And all you have to do is when you change your viewpoint to the scene, you somehow shift these different images over each other uh, to create an illusion of perspective change. Now, this is very easy to say, uh, but the, the good solutions of MPI they require two days of high performance calculations just to handle a 10 seconds video. So we are far from something real time. Uh, and it's very challenging to do that, uh, that, that kind of MPI uh, interpretation, because what you see here in the video um, is two solutions of MPI. The bottom one is the good solution. I think it's from Google um, and the top one is the bad solution. It's a straightforward solution where you just put all the objects in, that are in the different depths, uh, you put them over different um, layers, and you see it doesn't give a good impression uh, of perspective change. So MPI is much more than just having layer depth and, and that's it, it, it works, uh, no problem. So that exploration that we would like to do in, in MPEG is, is uh, really hard thing that uh, we have to do, that we have to tackle. Uh, but we hope that we can be able to reuse the V3C bitstream to enable these kind of applications. Too. And just to give you an idea, um, this is a solution uh, called the deep video, uh, where they basically have an intelligent way of creating these depths. So these depth images. So here, for instance, you, you have also a kind of spherical camera setup huh, with a lot of cameras looking around. 
these are the pictures that you collect, uh, that you acquire through these uh, cameras. And instead of just um, decomposing each picture into all its dead layers, there's somehow a mechanism to collect different depths into one group of images. Uh, like here, for instance, these are three images, three depths, let's say depth layers that are put together and that create this kind of image. So it's, it's a, a fraction, let's say, of the scene that you see there. Everything that is in black is transparent. And this is one fraction that you have to transmit. And there are other fractions of the, the scene that you have to transmit. So sometimes you don't see much. Sometimes you see much more. And to do the compression, these guys, what they do is exactly the same as with MIF, uh, with that image-based rendering with triangles. They put a mesh on the pixels, and it is that mesh that somehow is reprojected in space and, and then projected back to create that shifting effect between the different layers. So we really hope uh, that this kind of solution will be the next step of MIF or V3C. And actually, it, it, it gives really a very good effect. Huh? So here you see, uh, you, you can really move quite a lot in the scene. Huh? It's much better than, let's say, a Planopti camera acquisition where you have very limited movement. Here you can really move all around. Well, all around, I'm exaggerating, but uh, you, you, can, you have a big uh, freedom of movement with these uh, multiplane images. Oops. And so just uh, if you are interested to know how uh, this works, uh, well, you have some simulators actually. Huh? So at the left side, you have the solution that uh, our uh, department has uh, developed, which has been taken over by, by MPEG, which is called RVS, uh, whatever the name. Uh, and you have here links um, where you can play around and you even have the source code. And so now that, that code is uh, made public uh, by MPEG. And you see, if you go to that website, uh, you, you have an image and you can change the viewing position and you get the image that corresponds to that uh, specific viewing position that is here represented by the, the red spot here. Oops. So just have a try. And uh, in the same way, you have also here at the right side uh, that multiplane image approach, uh, which is somehow, uh, I would say, almost an extension of RVS, uh, so to speak, uh, with these meshes and the, these layers. Uh, these are different images that you have to transmit as layers. Uh, and when you go to that website, here is a link. And you can also move around a little bit and you see even all the reflections that look quite okay, I would say. So, so this is really to us the, the future, so to speak. So now that I have given you an idea of the kind of technology that has been developed within MPEG and the, the, the role we played in that uh, technology, I would like to show you some uh, aspects of a European project that, that we have, which is called uh, Hovitron, which is about holographic vision. And that holographic vision, it's for telerobotic operations, is actually based on light fields. It's based on the technology, uh, the image-based rendering technology that I explained to you before. And I would like you to give you some insights of what's happening. So the project is running now since uh, June of this year, uh, so just a couple of months. And the idea is that you have a scene uh, where there are robot arms handling something, but they are remotely controlled by an operator. So the operator has also uh, robot arms and his movements are basically projected uh, kilometers away uh, to the robot arms on site. And of course, the operator has to know what's happening there on site. So there is a capturing device and I will explain you later why we have chosen to have three by three cameras. This is not finite, but most probably we will do something like that. And so 
the scene is captured by these cameras. And all this corresponds to a sparse light field. It's a light field with a couple of viewpoints. And you can then, with that RVS, MIF, depth image based rendering technology, you can create a much denser light field. So any viewpoint, every millimeter position, let's say, and that is transmitted to a holographic display, a holographic head mounted device that the operator is wearing. And what is very nice in that is that it has the same effect as holography. So if the light field is sufficiently dense, your eyes will focus on the object you are looking at automatically. So if you have a scene uh, with two objects that somehow has been transmitted in a light field, you can you yourself at will without changing any parameter, without turning a knob or whatever, you can decide to focus your eyes on the front image or on the front object or on the background object. And that happens automatically, which is actually the holographic vision we want to have, which is very important for such robotic uh, teleoperation because you have to imagine you have a scene, the, the guy, well, the robot arms are manipulating something close, let's say to the virtual guy that is well sitting further away, but you know, virtually he's sitting around the, the robot arms. And he has to take a decision on what to, to capture in that scene. And that scene is very close to him. So he must be able to refocus his eyes to whatever object he sees. And for that, you need holographic vision, but you are not obliged to do holography with interference ranges. You can do dense light fields that basically recreate the holographic vision. And this is what the project is all about. And so the partner that is doing um, the, the holographic um, well, light field uh, head mounted device is scale. So they have already a prototype here. Uh, the robots uh, are done uh, by DLR, which is basically the uh, space agency uh, in Germany. Um, and then we have UPM and ULB that are doing, let's say, all the, the software and the uh, camera acquisitions. And so what you see here is basically the setup that we will follow. And what I would like you to, uh, well, I would like you to convince about is why did we make these uh, choices of so many cameras? Um, yeah, and before that, I would also like to say, what is the relation here with MPEG? Well, it's the fact that we have been contributing to MPEG by providing some software tools to them. But because we are in the MPEG consortium, we can also reuse very early all their software tools. And for instance, there are depth estimation tools, which are very good in, in MPEG, that we reuse for the Hovitron uh, project. So you see there is kind of give and take ecosystem. Uh, we have given things to MPEG, and now we collect back these things to be able to, to make the, the project Hovitron. So just to give you an idea of how these things work, I'm not allowed to give you all the insights of this uh, light field uh, head mount device. But OK, it's the, the main idea is as follows. You have here an SLM, a spatial light modulator, that basically gives, let's say, an image for a certain viewpoints. And then there is here a light source. But that light source is made of little LEDs, one by one, uh, side by side. And so you project an image on the SLM, you um, put on one LED here. Huh? So it's light coming from a certain direction. And by all these reflections in the prism, that light will be reflected in the direction here, uh, given by the, the red um, point uh, into the head mounted display. And then you uh, change, your, so you switch off uh, the first LED you change the image, uh, you take an image that has a little parallax compared to the, the first one, you switch on a new LED, and you, so you illuminate that image that is then given through another viewpoint. And so by multiplexing, time multiplexing all these images one by one, 
and changing little by little the direction of the light, you can create a very dense light field for each eye uh, in front uh, of the teleoperator, who can then, you know, so you will create a holographic effect, uh, holographic vision, and he can himself decide to focus his eyes on the object that would be here at uh, the top of his finger or another object that would be here in, in the middle. So there is already a prototype. Um, we are very happy. It works, but I'm not allowed to, to give uh, many insights of uh, this head-mounted device at this point in time. Um, and then also, for instance, for the, the camera setup, so we have been considering uh, using planoptic cameras. We are not abandoning it yet, but we think that um, just discrete camera array can do the job very well. And actually, it has already been proven by Fraunhofer. They had a project a couple of years ago you know, where they have three by three cameras. And they can somehow recreate the depth out of these three by three views. And this is the depth map. And then they recreate a kind of point cloud. And it's funny, they call it a light field. But here you see, if you go to uh, this, this video here on the internet, they call it really a point cloud. And it looks like a point cloud. And out of that, you can do special effects. For instance, you can do relighting. Uh, the actor has been captured with this kind of light. And you can change the light uh, and recalculate a new uh, light impression, because you have geometric information. And for relighting, you always need geometric information. You need the direction of the normals uh, on, on the, the object. Um, so you see, this technology has been shown already a couple of years ago. It's a kind of light field technology, but actually it's also point clouds. And this is the kind of technology that we will also use to capture the light field sparsely and then recreate a more dense light field later on. Very important in this process is to be able to have a good depth estimation. There exist some uh, implementations of uh, depth. The depth that you see here has been uh, done well. I worked on that when I was in my previous uh, company. Um, I make and okay, it, it, it works well, but not sufficiently well to do this kind of uh, depth image-based rendering. Uh, it was quite OK, but not perfect. And actually, uh, if you look to the state of the art, uh, you will see that at EPFL, they have also already made such uh, systems here only with uh, three cameras. It was in 2015, I think, yes, 2015. Um, and it's the same concept uh, over and over again. With these cameras, you estimate the depth, and then you can do any view uh, reprojection. And here you see, for instance, uh, that the guy is basically moving his cursor. And that gives another viewpoint uh, to the scene, to him in this case, because he's in front of the, the cameras. And that works quite well. But you see, there are some artifacts. Uh, so at that point in time, in 2015, OK, it was not yet mature. But now it's uh, mature. And this is the kind of technology that we will use. And actually, in 2015, these guys have even uh, been thinking of making a chip, because indeed, depth estimation is really a hard job to do. Uh, it's it's uh, the, the tools that exist, for instance, in, in MPEG take, let's say, 10 minutes of uh, processing on a GPU just for one image, uh, because you need a high quality. Uh, what you have to know is that these depth images have to be very high resolution and high quality. So it's not sufficient just to take a depth sensing device like Kinect and say, OK, here I have my depth. That's not sufficient. Uh, you need very high uh, depth quality, actually. But you see, all this technology exists already a couple of years ago. And what we have done now, basically, is we have put that into uh, MPEG first. And then we can reuse some of, let's say, improved technology from MPEG uh, into our project. And by putting all these pieces together, uh, we get uh, eventually the, the Hobbitron uh, project. It's not just an engineering project. Uh, it's, it's much more than that. But OK, it gives you an idea of the process that we have been through. 
So this brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. So I hope that uh, you you have been you could follow my explanation and my the difference between the, the point clouds and the light fields. There's not so much difference uh, that you have to know technologically speaking. They are very similar, and at the end of the day, MPEG has therefore created one single bitstream format, which is basically called V3C, which gives you the possibility to do light fields or point clouds, whatever, or depending on the application that you are targeting. And we will still continue in extending the, the functionalities of this V3C, like, for instance, uh, view-dependent lighting and, and things like that. And uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm very happy to have followed MPEG uh, since many years to be able to see what's happening in industry uh, so that, let's say, the, the academic people are not just uh, doing uh, things in their ivory tower, but really do things that are helpful. And it's, it's really a kind of ecosystem uh, between uh, doing some explorations and, and then bring it in a standard and then taking over some pieces of the standard to do the project and, and doing this in, in cycles. Okay, that's uh, all for today. Yes, uh, well, some acknowledgements uh, just for your information. So I'm happy to listen to your questions, if any. Thank you. Thank you, Gauthier, for your you know, excellent overview of what's going on in the field. Uh, we have many questions here. People are excited about your talk. Uh, first question comes from Portugal, from uh, Fernando Pereira, who spoke yesterday at, uh, in this school Hello, Fernando. about point clouds and immersive video. Um, he's from professor from uh, Instituto Superior Técnico. Uh, the question is, do you think the companies and applications that may use uh, VPCC and MIV are ready to use a standard using AGC with the associated well-known royalties problems? Question related to adoption and uh, relations to royalty problems. I, I couldn't completely follow. So the question is about whether they would use VVC? Yeah, do you think the companies and applications that may use VPPC, VPCC and MIV are ready to use a standard? Uh, using uh, uh, like EGC with the associated well-known royalties problems? Well, so actually, the, most of, of um, uh, this technology has been developed by companies. Uh, so the idea of all, all these uh, VPCC, MIF, and, and V3C is actually to have a codec independent uh, wraparound package. So it's not dependent on a codec. You can use whatever video codec you want, and that has been tested. So there has been an HEVC codec that has been tested, a VVC codec, I think even EVC. Whatever codec, uh, video codec uh, that, that um, you, you like, you can use it within that context. So it's the, the the V3C format is not directly connected to a specific codec. And so if you don't like uh, to use uh, VVC because there are royalty problems, uh, whatever, well, use whatever other codec that you like, and it can fit in, in that uh, framework without any problems. OK, another question, uh, Professor uh, Gautier. The food comes from uh, Tiago Lopez Silveira. He thanks you very much, like we do, for your presentation. Question is, uh, since 360 degree images are defined on the sphere, shouldn't we invest efforts in getting rid of planar representations which induce distortion? In your opinion, is it worth it to re redefine the whole coding approaches? Well, um... Let, let, let be clear uh, about one thing. All the, the MPEG codecs uh, work for whatever position of the cameras. So the MIF, for instance, is not only planar. It's true that a lot of test sequences are, are use planar cameras, but there are where you have the cameras into uh, an arc. Um, and also for VPCC, for instance, you are allowed to use something else than a cube. So you have that, that object that is in the middle surrounded by a cube. 
you can use, I don't know, an octahedron or whatever to do the, the reprojections. So the, uh, all the standards takes into account whatever pose of the cameras. So that has been uh, done. Um, even the depth estimation, uh, you, you know, of course, that uh, when you want to do stereo matching, it's always better to do a rectification of the images and so that you are on the same horizontal apipolar line, but that's not needed. Um, all the tools that have been developed work for whatever position, uh, non-planar positions, and it has been tested for non-planar positions. Perhaps we need to do more tests, that, that's true, but it's not uh, limited to a planar uh, setup, not at all. Okay, uh, next question comes from Guilherme Correa uh, from Federal University of Pelotas, who is uh, organizing also this school. Uh, thanks for your great talk, uh, Professor Lafouille. It's still in the same line of uh, Fernando Pereira's uh, question. Uh, would current and future royalty-free video formats, especially those outside the impacts related initiatives like VP9, AV1, AV2, uh, would those be compatible and usable with uh, VP, VPCC and MIV? Yes, yes, so uh, there's in principle no problem. Um, of course, we, we didn't test all these video codecs, huh? so perhaps there is, I don't know, something, a feature that is missing. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, um, you need, for instance, an alpha channel in your video codec um, because that is needed for the transparency in, for instance, the multiplane images. So for, for the future, I'm, I'm talking here about the future. So if you have a video codec that has no transparency uh, channel, alpha channel, there, yeah, you might have a problem. But it's not that you, uh, let's say the, the codec is really a kernel and then there is a kind of wraparound. Um, and there's a kind of wraparound uh, around the, the codec um, so in principle, any codec can be used, indeed. Of course, okay. you have to be careful with one thing. Um, it is the wraparound itself is transforming the content that you have into the format, in, into the video format, well, in, in the images. If that transform is, would need some technology, I cannot think of one, but would need a technology uh, that is patented, yeah, then, then of course you have a, a problem. But that has nothing to do with the codec itself. Okay. Uh, the following question comes from uh, Professor, Professor Fernando Pereira in Portugal. Uh, isn't a bit, bit misleading to call holographic to a system just using dense light fields and not real holographic data such as interference fringes? Uh, isn't this saturating the term holog holography, making it rather meaningless as meaning very different things? So it's, it has to do with uh, the way you call yeah. it uh, real holography uh, uh, and uh, you know, dense light fields instead. Well, I, I tend to agree with, with that remark. Indeed, we had a lot of discussions also in MPEG about, um, well, informal discussions, uh, because MPEG is not really doing holography at this point in time, at least. Um, but in, indeed, you have two kinds of things you have. Holography as it is defined originally, which is using interference fringes. And then you have what I call holographic vision. And holographic vision is just the functionality to be able to uh, focus your eyes on the object at, at a certain distance uh, that you don't need um, to, to do anything. Uh, it's it, by free will, you, you focus on whatever you like. This I call holographic vision. And it doesn't come from me, uh, basically. There are many people that even say that any functionality that gives that eye accommodation is holographic. I, I do not agree with that. Uh, so I, I tend to agree with Fernando that if you really want to avoid any misleading thing, if you have interference fringes, you call it holography. If you don't have interference fringes, you call it something else. But the functionality of eye accommodation is actually something that can be achieved with dense light fields. 
Uh, and okay. actually the, the only good solution at this point in time uh, for having that for video is then slide fields. Um, yeah, now it's, it's getting a little bit um, confusing, but let's put it in that way. If you want to have eye accommodation, you need to have multiple light rays that enter your pupil. If you have so a kind of micro parallax uh, of the light rays entering your pupil, you get eye accommodation. You get that holographic vision thing. And actually, you don't need so many light rays. Huh? So the pupil is, is small, of course, and it's five millimeters. But you, you need something like, I, I don't know, uh, 50, uh, 30 light rays, and, and you get already that effect of eye accommodation. You okay. can also you can also have uh, uh, eye accommodation with real holography. Um, and Vivid Q, for instance, is a company that is doing real holography with interference fringes. And it works also, but you have to be careful about one thing. If you have uh, an holographic display that is directly projecting uh, into your eye, okay, technology can do it because the resolution that you need is quite acceptable, let's say. But if you want to have a hologram, uh, like a, a painting that you put on the wall, and you would like to have that holographic effect, then of course, you would also like to have a large field of view. Huh? You have your, your painting in front of you and you want to, to move left and right. To have a high field of view, a large field of view, you need very tiny pixels. And actually, if you do all the calculation, you, you need hundreds or thousands of billions of pixels. I'm not talking about millions of pixels, it's billions of pixels. And so good luck uh, to make that work in, in reality. So to me, holography, the real holography uh, with interference fringes is possible when you have a head-mounted display where you project directly in the eye and you need only a small field of view, all the rest, it's impossible with the technology that we have today, it's impossible to get with interference ranges. And then you have no other choice than to fall back on dense light fields that I agree are not holography, but that give a holographic vision. Okay, that was clarifying. Uh, do you believe, the question comes from Lisbon, Fernando Pereira, do you believe the uh, you know, video point cloud coding will be royalty free if you use a royalty free video codec related I, to royalty I again? So. I think so, but honestly, um, I, I would not like to say yes, I'm 100% sure. Uh, so I, I really think that we have to, to check that. I didn't fo follow VPCC sufficiently well to know all the details, but I have the impression that yes, it, it might work. Okay, next, next question comes from uh, Brasilia, Brasilia City. Uh, Professor Ricardo Queiroz from University of Brasilia is asking, uh, Professor Gauthier, what is the status of SLF within the MIV in V3C, V3C uh, effort? Well, hi, <laughs> Ricardo, you know better than me <laughs> what, what is the status. Uh, I remember that in the last MBIC meeting, um, there were discussions about having surface light fields. Uh, some people were against it um, because they, they were saying it's not mature enough. Um, as far as I know, it's, it's basically started in an exploration phase. So it's considered as serious. Uh, I also remember that um, a couple of years ago, it was already presented uh, in, at a certain point of time. And it was the same position that, that MPEG has taken to say, oh, this is interesting, but we don't know yet whether it really fits the bill completely. So let's do the exploration. And, uh, and I, I really think that, well, VPCC, for instance, is, uh, is already um, standardized. So there will be an exploration for second version of VPCC. For MIF, uh, I would say that the, the surface light fields uh, like stuff 
corresponds to um, what we call non lambertian uh, It's actually the same. So your, your color is changing depending on the viewpoint. And that is something that will not be looked at today. We will first finalize the MIF standards, um, which is in, in a couple of uh, meetings, so sorry, mid next year, something like that. And then we will do extensions to non lamb version. Um, this being said, the MPI, so the multiplane images, they give already some non lamb version capabilities and they will be considered in the ver first version of MIF. So let's wait and see um, what will happen. Um, so the functionality of surface light fields somehow will be a little bit in MIF already, I think. But it depends on, on the next meetings. Huh? So the, the MPI stuff has not been started yet. Huh? So it will be an exploration phase starting from uh, January uh, next year. OK. <clears throat> well, we still have some minutes uh, before breaking uh, the session. Uh, I have a question of my own uh, on M MPI, the multiplane images. Uh, according to what you have shown, it seems that you have limitations uh, regarding the angle of the different uh, uh, planes. So uh, the MPI has any intrinsic limitations of how, how much uh, diversity in angle can you have in, in capturing the planes? Well, it's, it's true that um, if you have your, your, your planes one after each other, you can not really look orthogonal uh, in, in a direction that is parallel to the planes. Huh? So you, you need a viewing direction that is almost orthogonal to the planes. But um, I, I have to, to say that you are not limited to putting planes in one direction. You can put planes in one direction and another set of planes in another direction and another set of planes in another direction. And that collection of planes can still give you a viewpoint change. The problem with that collection of planes in different directions is that the view, uh, the rendering is not that complex. You can just use the, the reference software that exists now, but you cannot optimize it. So if you can limit your application to multiplanes, just one set of multiplanes in, in a certain direction, then you can optimize the rendering quite heavily, and then you can have real-time rendering. So it's trade-off between what do you want, real-time rendering, uh, or do you want to have really a, a large field of view? Um, th that's again okay. something that will depend on the requirements that will be set up in January uh, next year. So okay, so we're looking forward to, to this next development. Uh, another question uh, comes from Professor Fernando Pereira uh, and deals with uh, deep learning in you know, tools, you know, applying uh, you know, machine learning and uh, all this uh, hookaba stuff that comes you know, on, now in video coding. Uh, so he's asking, uh, no role for deep learning tools in MIV as of now? What about the future? Now, What's your vision? No. So the first version will not be with, with any deep learning tools, that, that's for sure. But the, the next uh, version, who knows? Um, I think, honestly, if we want to do non lamb version things, uh, it might be interesting to also consider deep learning tools. And that depends on the participants. Huh? If, if a participant says, OK, we set up a requirement about non lamb version scenes, uh, and then the, the next cycle, he pops up with a tool and that is a deep learning tool and it works nicely. Yeah, then people will, will accept the, the tool, I guess. Um, so it's, it's not excluded, but in the first version, there are no deep learning tools. Yeah, there, there's a follow up from uh, uh, Fernando Pereira. He said, uh, for instance, uh, what about using uh, deep learning for just solving the stitching problems? So he made a follow up. Yeah, sure. In, in, let's say, academic papers, there, there are a lot of papers, uh, deep stereo and, and things like that. They, they do a lot of deep learning for whatever you, you like, stitching, uh, view interpolation, all these things. Um, uh, even even multiplane images, uh, they, they do uh, deep learning, uh, the deep video, for instance. Um, I would say that all these deep learning stuff 
Um, it can pop up in the tools that will be used uh, for me, for VPCC even, or whatever, but I, not for the coding as such. Uh, so yeah, you have to make a difference between, let's say the bitstream format uh, and, and what you send in, in the bitstream and the tool that, that gives you the, the, the information that you will get into the bitstream. The first one, the bitstream is normative. The tool that gives you one implementation to get the data is not normative. So even the rendering, for instance, is not normative in MIF, neither in MIF, neither in, in VPCC. Uh, so it's a tool that is given to the participants so that we can do tests, but it's not mandatory to use that tool. It's, it's like motion estimation in a video codec. You, you define in a normative way the, the format of the, the motion vectors, but how you get the motion vectors is up to you. Uh, and I think that all these deep learning tools will happen more in, let's say, the pre-processing and the post-processing, so the rendering, than in the coding. Unless some people say, yeah, you can reach high performance with coding, yeah, with the, the coding aspects, but then then we need to make a bridge with the AI coding uh, group. It might happen, but at this point in time, it's not there. But all this depends on the wishes of the industry, uh, of, of the people, of the participants saying, I, I would like to have this or that. And then if people find it relevant, okay, then it's put in requirements and out of the requirements, they look to which group can do the job and then experiments are launched in, in that group. So it's not excluded that it will come, but at this point in time, it's not there. Okay. Well, uh, I have one last question of myself. It's more of a pragmatic question. Uh, I know say in terms of, uh, of cost and of adoption uh, in the future for this uh, capturing, from the capturing end, you know, a planotic camera versus array of, array of cameras like you were using in, uh, Hobby thrown an array of cameras that I understood. So uh, in, in the midterm, do you think that uh, cost-wise, uh, what, uh, what those two source technologies will be uh, adopted widely? Because you know, that has to do with adoption in producing the source, uh, the source uh, images and uh, data streams. So planotic versus uh, camera versus array of uh, you know, conventional cameras. Mm -hmm. What will be winning the, the, the hurts and soul of uh, people working in immersive? Well, to, to me, it will be the camera, the, the discrete cameras. Um, even though they, they take more space, yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, I, I do not believe that the planoptic cameras will, will be used because of the cost. Yeah. Well, actually, you had Lytro was there. Uh, Raytrix is, is also a, a planoptic camera company. And from all these companies, you only have one left, uh, which is Raytrix, actually. And the, the cost of their cameras is, is uh, not negligible. I will not say how much. And they don't use it for immersive applications. They use it uh, to have extended depth of field uh, for machine vision, um, which makes a lot of sense. So we, we contacted once uh, Raytrix to say, are you interested in compression and immersive video and things like that? I said, no way, this is not our domain. We only do machine vision, extended depth of field. And, and in that domain, it, it's a success. Um, but for immersive video, I, I really do not believe anymore in these planoptic cameras. There might be some applications perhaps where it's, it's useful. For instance, if you have Lambertian scenes, you, you have with a, a small change uh, of uh, capturing direction, you have a sudden change in, in reflection. And that cannot be captured by conventional cameras because they are too big. Even the smallest cameras take three centimeters, uh, um, let's say side by side. So um, I think that there in these special circumstances, you might envisage to have planoptic cameras, but you have to okay. look to the cost. The cost is high. Yeah, okay. It's a question of niche versus mass market adoption. Okay, uh, uh, I see here in the Q and A um, windows uh, we don't have any more questions uh, to you, uh, Gautier. 
So uh, at this time, uh, I would, uh, you know, we are right at the hour of noon here. Uh, we would like to, to invite uh, people to come uh, at 1.30 for the next talk to be given by a Brazilian uh, uh, Vanessa Sony, who's going to speak about also the Brazilian participation in, uh, in this standardization uh, uh, programs and, uh, and bodies and give an overview. So he will, she will speak in Portuguese at, uh, at 1.30 today, one hour and 30 from now. Uh, for now, uh, I would like, on behalf of the organizers of the uh, of the school, uh, you know, uh, professors uh, uh, Bruno Zacci, Professor Agostini, Marcelo Porto, uh, and many colleagues, Guilherme Correa from uh, Federal University of Pelotas, I would like to thank you, uh, Gautier, uh, for your uh, very enlightening talk, and uh, thank you for all this deep involvement and contributions that you and your group have been doing uh, to those standardization efforts and the groundbreaking works that are coming from from the LISA lab. So again, you know, thank you. And uh, I will leave now uh, the word to you to give your last uh, remarks and message here for the for the people working in this field here in uh, in Brazil. So uh, please, the, the floor is yours now for good year to for your last remarks. Thank you very much. Many thanks to have invited me and, and it was really a pleasure to explain uh, all these things. Um, I, I hope that you could learn something out of that um, because indeed MPEG is a difficult thing. Uh, if, if you want to follow the, the standards, you, you have really to be very involved. So I, I was very happy to try to, to give uh, an overview, uh, let's say, of uh, what's happening. And I would really encourage people uh, and, and certainly academic people to, to follow standardization uh, processes, because I really believe that um, in, the, in the very early stages, so the exploration experiments, that there the academia can really play a big role. Uh, it becomes more difficult at the end, uh, when, when it's close to a standard, because then you have to do thousands of tests, and, and yeah, academia do, do not have uh, the time to do all this. Uh, so that's really for the industry. But if you want to know what's really happening in industry in, in these domains, um, it's, it's worth following uh, these, these standardization uh, activities. Um, really, honestly, I've learned more in uh, these standardization activities than in most of the conferences. Because you, the, the conferences, yeah, OK, uh, you, you, you you know what's happening there uh, because you are every day in that, that field. But knowing what the, the industry is doing and, and trying to make the bridge with, with them, that's really challenging and, and very interesting. And so I would really recommend people to, to envisage uh, following uh, standardizations, but don't be completely swallowed by it. That, that's true because it's an industrial activity, but it gives a lot of insights uh, of new technologies that, that will be used, uh, actually. So really, if you have time and, and money <laughs> to, to travel, <laughs> please uh, follow these, uh, um, these activities. Um, it's better than conferences, because conferences is every year, while these activities are every three months. So you really, you progress quite a lot uh, by doing that. So this right. is my final, my final word. And, Please do it. Be involved in it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your advice and thanks for your very, uh, you know, enlightening and, and inspiring talk. Uh, thanks a lot for, for, for it, uh, Professor Lafuit. Mm -hmm.